Okay, so we're looking at the BTEC Level 3 National Extended Diploma in Business. Um, and we're looking at specifically the Unit 2 Developing a Marketing Campaign exam. Um, and this exam is taken by probably many different um, courses by BTEC Level 3. Um, so again, we're looking at the Unit 2 Developing a Marketing Campaign exam. Um, and we're looking at the PESTO analysis. And this part um, is part of your justification part. Okay, so in your justification, um, you can use one or more analytical tools. So, um, you know, some are Porter's Five Forces, um, Product Lifecycle, um, a SWOT analysis, and a PESTO analysis. I tell my students to only do a PESTO analysis and um, a SWOT analysis. So those are the two analytical tools I tell my students to do. So the definition of a PESTO analysis is a PESTO analysis is a framework used to examine the external factors affecting a business. OK, and um, the PESTO analysis stands for political, economical, social, technological, legal and environmental or ethical. So the first one is political and um, below are some examples of political factors, which include tax policies subsidies or grants, um, government stability, government policies, trade regulations, and government bans or labour laws. Okay, so if we look at maybe tax policies, for instance, um, corporation tax, uh, the current corporation tax charge is 19%. Okay, but well, that's going to increase to 25% in, um, in 2023, the 1st of April. OK, so that means businesses will have to pay more on their profits, OK, in taxes to the government. So, again, corporation tax is going to increase. But that, remember, that's next year. That's in 2023. So depending on, um, you know, how long your smart objectives are or how long it's running for or what year the, uh, the business is looking to launch the product, um, you may want to take that into consideration. OK, so um, we've also got subsidies or grants. So a subsidy is a, um, it's a it's an amount of money given by the government, uh, usually to producers, usually to businesses so that they produce more, so that they produce more output. And uh, this should lower the cost um, of the business, of the business's cost, which in turn means that the business can charge a lower price to consumers. OK, so a subsidy essentially um, increases production lowers the costs and lowers the prices. Um, and a grant is quite similar. A grant is just an amount of money given to a business. Usually the business has to um, meet a certain criteria or follow certain regulations um, um, and then they, they're entitled to the grant or, or uh, they have to follow these regulations whilst using the grant. Okay, So a grant is money given to a company or a business or even a person um, and, and that grant doesn't have to be paid back. OK, the money doesn't have to be paid back. Okay, So um, during COVID, um, as, as people were granted grants, um, businesses were given grants um, and this money doesn't have to be paid back. Um, government stability, we're just looking at the government and how stable a government is. If it's um, extremely stable, then maybe it's a good um, maybe it's a good country to start up a company in. Um, if a government or a country is is uh, unstable um, we probably don't really want to open up a business there because we're unsure of what the future holds there um, for example certain countries in war you probably don't want to um, open up a business there because it's, it's not really um, that well, that's not really a good idea is it um, certain government policies uh, and government bans I'll just put those together so you know, different governments and different countries have different policies. Uh, I'll leave that to you to research. Maybe the research that you're given um, will identify certain government policies in that country. Um, but maybe you can bring in your own research and your own um, information into the exam. So, for example, on the right there, it says the foreign secretary, Liz Truss, announces a ban on services exports, including management, consulting, accounting and public relations to Russia. Um, so that's an interesting one. And we've also got trade regulations, so you might want to bring in something to do with uh, Brexit and how there's uh, no longer free trade between um, the UK and EU countries. Um, so now exports and imports cost. Um, so, so we're talking about tariffs there. Um, and now we're looking at labour laws. OK, so labour laws, you know, there's a, a range of different labour laws and I've just taken one here. Um, you can't work more than 48 hours a week on average. 
okay? Um, so this law is sometimes called the working time directive or the working time regulations, okay? Um, so that's an interesting one. There are some exceptions, um, but generally that's the rule, okay? So that's political for you. Make sure, um, you know, when you get your exam and you analyze the case study, part A, make sure you, you're looking for certain um, factors which relate to PESCO, okay? So any political factors here, um, just keep an eye out for them. And remember, these are just some examples. You might find something else in your um, case study, or you might research something else. That's fine. Bring that in, okay? Don't restrict yourself to just the information I'm showing you here. Now, we're looking at economical. So these are the economic factors affecting a business. Examples of economic factors include interest rates, exchange rates, inflation, trade regulations again, the tax rate, um, economic growth, disposable incomes, and the unemployment rate. Okay, so interest rates, remember, is the uh, the cost of borrowing, all right, and the reward for saving. Um, and generally speaking, uh, you know, if, if interest rates are high, then the cost of borrowing is high. Um, the amount you pay back on your uh, monthly loans, whether it's a mortgage, whether it's just interest on a loan you've taken out from the bank, um, if the interest rate is high, the amount you pay back is going to increase. So you're left with less disposable income. So you're going to buy less. Um, having said that, if the interest rate is high, um, that means that the reward for saving is high. So again, you're going to save more. So you should be earning more in terms of saving. All right. So, um, so again, yeah, if the interest rate is high, you won't be consuming a lot. You'll you'll opt to save more money. Now, having said that, if the interest rate is low, then the opposite is true. Okay, so if the interest rate is low. People will take out more loans because now the cost of borrowing is cheaper. If the interest rate is low, people will save less because there's less incentive of keeping your money um, in the bank in a savings account, so on and so forth. Okay, so people will spend more if the interest rate is low. Um, so recently, the interest uh, the interest rate has increased from 0.5 percent to 0.75 percent. Okay, so this is actually encouraging people to to, to do what? To probably save more um, and spend less. Okay, so the interest rates have increased. Um, currently, the exchange rates, I've just given two exchange rates there. So the pound to the dollar and the pound to the euro. Um, one pound will buy you one dollar and 23 cents. Um, and that's actually, um, that's actually uh, not, in, that's not actually a good thing. Okay, so the, the exchange rate has actually worsened. Okay, the pound has actually gotten uh, weaker, okay, over time. Um, you can just do a quick Google. You can type in uh, one GBP, one Great British Pound, two USD, US dollar, um, and it should give you a mini graph there as well. And you can click on um, daily rate and how how the uh, the pound and dollar has changed. The relationship between those two currencies um, has changed in a day. You can click on one year and see the relationship over a year. Or you can click on five year period and see the, the relationship over a five year period. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Okay, um, so the, the 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 pound has actually gone weaker over um, the years. Okay, so that means that if it now um, if 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 it now costs us um, one dollar twenty three cents, businesses that are um, importing materials from the U.S. let's say, it's now costing them more. It's now costing them more. They have to buy more um, dollars with their pounds to purchase those goods. Okay. So they're worse off. Um, and now the pound, the pound to the euros is one euro and I think 17. Um, and that's fairly been the same over the past year. I think, over the past year. It's fairly been the same. It's remained the same. So there's not much change there. Um, so we're also looking at um, inflation. OK. And when it comes to inflation, prices are rising by 7% a year in the UK. And this is the highest rate for 30 years. The Bank of England has warned inflation might reach 10% within a few months as the price of fuel and food puts pressure on household budget. Um, and there was a really good article that I was looking at um, on the BBC News website. Um, so if you maybe type in some of these words here from that first, um, maybe if you type in prices are rising by 7% a year in the UK and type in BBC Business News in Google, um, you'll find the same article I was reading. It's a great article. It tells you the different um, uh, price increases in terms of fuel and taxations. Great uh, article to read and to take in with you to the exam in terms of the knowledge. 
Okay. Um, inflation is increase in the price of something over time, in case you didn't know. Okay, so it's the average increase of, of prices over a year. Um, for example, if a loaf of bread costs one pound one year and one pound seven pence the next year, then that's an annual inflation rate of seven percent. Okay, now remember that's just a loaf of bread. All right, so we're looking at um, sometimes we could be looking at bigger items that, that cost hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds. All right, imagine the seven um, percent increase in that. We're looking at pounds added on or tens of pounds added on, even hundreds of pounds added on to, to items. So inflation is a uh, probably a big thing to talk about, especially now in these current times with the war between Russia and Ukraine um, pushing up prices all over um, the world globally. OK, um, I'm pretty sure you've all heard about energy prices going up, petrol prices going up. Um, so, so inflation, that's all to do with inflation. Uh, we've got certain trade regulations. Again, you can bring in uh, Brexit, the costs of imports and exports. We've got tax rates. We've already gone over corporation tax. You could talk about the rate of VAT, okay, value added tax. This is a tax paid when buying goods and services. Um, and this has gone up for some businesses. The government reduced VAT for hospitality and tourism firms during the pandemic. But on the 1st of April, it returned to the standard 20% uh, rate. Okay, So again, you can talk about that increasing depending on what the business is. If it's a hospitality or a tourism uh, related uh, business. And we can um, directly uh, talk about VAT. OK, we've got economic growth and just uh, the economy growing. Um, and we've got disposable incomes. All right. These are all economical factors and how much people have in terms of their actual um, incomes and how much they can spend of it. Um, and the unemployment rate is currently at 3.9 percent, which is actually quite low. OK, so unemployment rate is actually quite low. That means a lot of people are in work, a lot of people are employed, and a lot of people have jobs. All right. So again, that's the economical um, in terms of pestle. If you see anything related to economical, highlight it in part A and be prepared to use that um, during your part B, during your, during your exam. We're now looking at social. These are the social factors affecting a business. Examples of social factors include population rates, the median age of a nation, certain trends, the number of people married or single, culture, religion and ethnicity, whether a person is health conscious or not, um, and the lifestyle somebody leads. So um, population rates is a very good one to talk about. So if the population rate is increasing, generally speaking, that means people are going to demand more in that country. Um, you know, there's more people, so they're going to need more goods and services. Um, it's really as simple as that. If the population rate is decreasing in that country, uh, people are going to demand less. All right. Um, number two, the median age of a nation. So on average, um, what is the what is the age of a person in that nation? So, for example, we could pick the UK. This is just for example. You might want to research this for yourself. But you could, um, based on your research, you could uh, identify, find out that the average age of a person in the UK is maybe in their thirties, right, or thirty years old. That means um, half of the nation is above 30 years old and the other half of the nation is below 30 years old. OK, that's what we mean by median age of, of nation. Right. So, um, you know, how old are people generally um, or most people? How old are most people in a nation? Uh, we've got trends and um, I'll probably leave that to you. But I, I think personally, if I had to say there were certain trends going on, you could say things like um veganism okay so vegan is on the is on the rise There's a lot of talk about veganism and just uh, being more health conscious and eating less um meat um and just eating more healthier and eating more greens okay so uh, vegan veganism is a trend and you know we had the um the unit two exam on plant-based milk didn't we or a sample assessment on um plant-based milk so you know veganism is a is a trend we could say more health conscious people in terms of um, going to the gym and working out that could be seen as a trend more people working out um, and just more women in general uh, engaging in certain activities like sports and even gym okay so these are uh, things that are trending now and just becoming more normalized which is a good thing um, the number of people married or single so the number of marriages has actually decreased okay people aren't getting married anymore um, and this may be due to uh, multiple reasons. 
Uh, maybe people see uh, marriage as a bad thing, possibly. Maybe people see um, marriage as too much of a, of a risk. Um, maybe people feel like they're just not cut out for marriage um, and it's too tough for them to handle. I'm not too sure. Um, but again, that could be something you wish to research. But the number of people married or the number of single people is a social factor. Okay, How does that affect your business or, or, or the case study that they've given you? Right? The business in the case study that they've given you. How does the number of married people affect that? It depends on the business. Um, if it's a business to do with, I don't know, hiring out venues and stuff like that, then maybe the number of married people um, is an important social factor to discuss. OK, um, another social factor is uh, another social factor is culture, religion and, and ethnicity. So obviously, people of different um, cultures and religion and ethnicities will demand and want uh, different products. I'll give you a prime example. Obviously, Muslim people, when it comes to meat, they need their meat to be halal. Um, so this is a prime example um, and different cultures and different religions and ethnicity some religions they don't eat meat okay but these are some things that we need to take into consideration um, and again we've already gone over the health conscious people so a lot more people are uh, vegans a lot more people are uh, going to the gym and a lot more people are um, educated on uh, being healthy um, but you could also argue it the other way a lot more people are using um, uber eats and just eat and ordering fast food. Fast food is on the rise. There's a lot of delivery services now um, competing against each other. So uh, you could argue it the other way as well. Um, and the the last social factor I've got down here is lifestyle. Okay, so depending on the person and where they are in their lifestyle, um, business or the, the case study or, 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 or product could apply to someone. Okay, so. If I was a student, for instance, and I was going to Tesco's, um, you know, I'd probably buy a meal deal. I'd probably buy single items for myself. Um, but if I was a father, um, if I was a family man, which I am, and I have uh, two kids, um, then I would go to Tesco's and I would buy multi-pack items. Okay, I would buy items that will last a long time. So it depends on your lifestyle and where you are in your lifestyle. Okay, are you a student? Are you a family person? Do you have uh, children in your family or younger than five maybe so then if that's true then you're buying different items yeah okay so those are uh, certain social factors i think one of the main things for social factors is just if anything's trending okay so when you get your research pack pack a just look out for any trends that you can see okay that should be a social factor now we're moving on to technological technological okay so these are the technological factors affecting a business. Example of technological factors include automation or machines doing people's work, um, research and development, apps, mobile phones, the internet, and innovation. Okay, so examples of technological factors include automation. Now, automation is basically just machines doing things for people or machines replacing um, um, people. Um, and uh, obviously, if machines replace people, that means that there's, you know, there's less jobs for actual people. Um, and as you can see in that little um, BBC News article at the bottom, there it says machines are to are expected to do half of all work tasks by 2025. OK, so a million more jobs will be lost to robots with COVID accelerating the trend. Okay, So actually COVID and lockdown led to innovation. It led to businesses um, wanting to invest as well into different types of machinery which could replace people um, to complete jobs and tasks. Okay, um, And they're saying that in 2025, half of all work tasks will be, will be completed by machines. So, you know, there will be uh, there will be a more demand for more highly skilled workers, I guess, to be doing other sorts of jobs. And uh, the low skilled jobs will be taken by machines. Um, so I guess that will push people to study more. Um, and, and to be more highly skilled okay but at the same time people are going to lose jobs um, and uh, you know learning new tasks and switching over um, that's going to take time so there's going to be a time lag in that so it's, it's not just going to happen you know overnight people have to study people have to learn new skills people have to um, you know uh, get GCSEs or get university degrees um, and then train and be trained so it's going to be a lot of investment um, from firms as well in terms of this. Um, when it comes to machines, we're looking at maybe drones as well, drones being used for maybe deliveries. That's something that Amazon was looking at. 
Um, however, it's not being uh, allowed just yet, but it's something that could we we could see it in the future. Who knows? Um, self-service checkouts is an example of machines um, being implemented in supermarkets. You see it all the time. All right. Um, a good thing about self self-service checkouts is. You know, you just uh, go to the machine and you scan your items yourself. A bad thing is, um, you know, there's always issues with it. The, the, the flashing red light always flashes and then somebody has to come and sort that out. And that takes time sometimes. Um, when it comes to technological factors, we're looking at research and development as well. OK, so um, a lot of businesses invest a lot into research and development. Um, some businesses like Samsung and Apple, um, they invest billions of dollars, billions of pounds into research and development um, and that makes it hard that, that makes the barriers to entry into those phone markets and um, any other items like apple watch or samsung watch anything else that they're selling it makes it hard for um, other companies to enter um, that market so it makes the barriers to entry high um, because they have such a high research and development it's hard to um, enter those markets but um, a lot of businesses will conduct research and development and from from conducting that research and development will come up with innovative new ideas, okay? So um, that's a factor to talk about as well. Um, when we're talking about technological, we're talking about apps. Um, a lot of businesses have apps now. Um, Nike have, has, has an app. Um, you know, a lot of uh, restaurants have apps as well, okay, so where you can um, order food or just check out the menu and stuff like that. I remember going to a, um, a restaurant a couple of years ago and there was a QR code on the table and I had to scan the QR code with my phone and then the menu came up on my phone. And I thought, wow, like this is amazing. But at the same time, I didn't really like that personally. I'd rather have a menu, um, but it is what it is. And I'm seeing a lot more shops do that now. And it's becoming normal. So, yeah, it's quite cool. Um, so a lot more businesses are, are incorporating apps. So that could be something you discuss in your exam. I think that's a great thing to discuss. OK, apps. Um, so don't be afraid to talk about that. Mobile phone usage as well. Again, similar to apps, taking pictures, um, the menu coming up. Maybe I, I was a bit ahead of myself, but mobile phones is to do with, you know, taking pictures and the menu coming up, and stuff like that. Um, people using mobile phones and apps in terms of maybe Instagram, um, Snapchat, um, social media to, uh, to promote your business. Maybe you could discuss, um, maybe we could discuss certain businesses could use uh, competitions as well. Um, you know, if you take a picture and you share it with ten people, post it in your story, it could work as a form of promotion when we when when we when you're discussing the marketing mix as well, that could link in with that. But apps and mobile phones is a great thing uh, to discuss, especially because everyone has a mobile phone now, especially a smartphone. Uh, we look at the internet. Um, definitely, your business, uh, whatever it is, it should definitely have something to do with the internet. Um, people should be able to access your business online, wherever they are in the world. So the internet and trying to incorporate that is a great um, is a great thing to discuss. Okay, I wouldn't shy away from that. Internet is 110% something to discuss. Um, whatever the business is, there's always a space for the internet for it. Um, and innovation. Okay, so research and development should lead to innovation. We're looking at legal now. I'm looking at the law. Um, these are the legal factors affecting a business. Examples of legal factors include employment laws. Trade laws, consumer protection laws, copyright, trademark, patent laws, health and safety laws, minimum wage um, acts and laws and environmental laws. OK, so I've got just got a few examples here. I'm not going to go through them all because uh, there's quite a few laws. Yeah, there's like um, discrimination laws, um, um, equality acts um, and, and, and loads more laws. But I can't go through all of them. But I'll just say a quick Google you should come up with them. Um, and you should be able to discuss them, okay? And you should be able to identify whether, you know, there, there's a law that applies to uh, your business in the case study from reading part A, okay? So we're looking at employment laws and how that affects people. Um, and we're looking at, for example, minimum wage laws, okay? And at the bottom there, uh, you can see the minimum wage paid um, to people, okay? So this is currently, so from April 2022, this is what applies, okay? Um, so if you're an apprentice, uh, the minimum amount um, you're allowed to be paid is £4.81 an hour. If you're under 18, again, the minimum legal amount you're allowed to be paid is £4.81 an hour. Um, the business or the company can't pay you anything less than that. 
Okay, they could be fined, they could be sued, um, and obviously it will give them a negative, um, a negative image. All right, so, so the business shouldn't be paying you any less than what is stated there. Otherwise, that's illegal. So if you're 18 to 20, the minimum amount of business can pay you six pounds 83 pence. If you're 21 to 22, um, it's nine pounds 18 pence, and if you're 23 and over, that's known as the living wage now. And the minimum amount um, the businesses are allowed to pay you is nine pounds fifty. All right. So and, and obviously businesses tend to pay more than the minimum amount. Why? Because they want to keep you in. They want to attract um, workers. They want um, staff motivation and morale to be high. They want you to be productive in the workplace. Okay. So they tend to pay you higher than the minimum wage. Imagine you went to work and you realized, you know, this, the workplace is paying me the bare minimum that it's allowed to. Um, it might give you the thought or the idea that if the business could, it might pay me less if it could get away with it. Now, is that a business that cares about you? Probably not, okay? especially if they're paying the minimum wage. All right. So, again, businesses tend to pay you more um, to, to satisfy you. All right. So we've got also trade laws as well. Um, so you, if any trade laws come up, just talk about those. Um, some countries might have a ban on certain um, exports or imports. Some countries might have a quota, which means it's a limit, it's a number on the amount you can import or export to that country. Um, there's consumer protection laws. So, you know, uh, goods and services should be fit for purpose as described. Um, if not, you should be entitled to a uh, refund. Um, you've got copyright, trademark and patent laws. OK, so copyright is to do with music, books, videos, images and software. Um, and just remember that copyright is automatic. It's free. Um, you don't have to pay for uh, for something to be like copyrighted or pay for that protection. It just happens, right? So if you if you write a book, or if you create a video, or if you create an image, um, you automatically have copyright protection. Okay. If somebody steals that image or uses that image or um, you know uses your book or uh, reproduces that book that you just created, um, you can sue them. Okay. Uh, we've got a trademark, which is basically uh, uh, logos or phrases or um, a business name, and, and, and it's protecting that. Okay? Um, and this actually has a cost to it. It has a price, and it's quite expensive. But businesses are prepared to pay a higher um, price to protect their logo, to protect their slogan or phrase, or protect their business name. Okay? Um, and we've also got patent laws. All right? So this protects an invention or, or a certain new process. All right? And it stops competitors or people that um, want to come into the industry from copying from copying you for a certain set of years, okay, so, so a certain set number of years. Um, and obviously, the, the amount you pay for the patent reflects the amount of years your uh, product or innovation or process is protected for, okay? Um, we've got health and safety laws. Um, we've got the minimum wage, which we've already gone over, and then we've got environmental laws, okay? So maybe a certain amount that you're allowed to pollute, and you shouldn't pollute more than that. If you do, you will be fined or sued, okay? Or business made to be shut down. Now, we've got environmental slash ethical, and this is the last one. So these are the environmental slash ethical factors affecting business. Examples of environmental ethical factors include recycling, pollution, reducing carbon footprint, the weather, climate change, sustainability, fair trade, and animal testing, okay? So environmental is more to do with, um, I would say, number one to number uh, five. Um, and I would say ethical factors are more number six to number eight. OK, um, so recycling is very I, I think it, um, this is very basic now, but recycling is all about just, you know, recycling um, and reusing um, uh, materials where we can. Um, and why is this a good thing? Why is it a good thing to recycle? Businesses um, tend to recycle because people genuinely, genuinely like it when businesses recycle. If, if they see that businesses is recycling or reusing materials and not just um, wasting materials, people will buy into that business. People are prepared to spend more at that business because they want to be a part of a business that recycles and is doing good for the um, for the for the country. All right. Um, not just nationally, but internationally. All right. Um, another example of environmental is pollution. OK, so a business should try to reduce its pollution levels as much as possible. It should try not to pollute at all. 
um, businesses who try to reduce their carbon footprint as well. So again, maybe in terms of um, suppliers um, and ordering equipment or ordering items, uh, businesses should just try and make one order a week. And that means that uh, a lorry will come once to their establishment instead of ordering twice a week and that lorry having to make the same journey twice. Okay, So businesses should try to be smart where they can try and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, if the business or the organization is, in, is a business that uh, involves a lot of driving, then maybe they need to look at like electric vehicles right? or electric cars. Um, the weather, the weather can be an, an environmental factor. So depending on the weather, maybe that affects crops and crops production and the amount that uh, producers can produce. Um, if there's a, uh, if there's a, if there's like um, severe weather or flooding, for instance, and that means less crops are produced that year, and that means we have less supply, and that means that the price of these goods, whatever it is, will increase. Okay, um, climate change is a big one. Um, so that's something to discuss um, sustainability. So sustainability is basically providing for present generations uh, whilst looking at for future generations. OK, so, for example, um, if our business is making tables and chairs using wood, um, if, if we're cutting down trees and making tables and chairs, um, is that sustainable? Is it? You know, it, it takes years for a tree to grow and to mature. Um, and we're just cutting them down. Um, is that a good thing? Is that sustainable? Probably not. Um, but if for every tree we cut down, we then plant a new tree in, in its place, um, that could be argued as sustainable, okay? Because we're, uh, we're planting a new tree in its place, okay? We've got fair trade. Oh, and, and sustainability. Maybe we want to look at using more renewable energy resources as well. Okay. Um, we've got fair trade as well. So fair trade is all about, um, well, have you ever gone to the supermarket and seen a packet of bananas or fruit with a fair trade sticker on it or, or chocolate with a fair trade sticker on it? This just simply means that um, the business has paid its workers a fair wage um, and the, uh, the working conditions and the working environment for the workers is fair. It's good. Now, if you think about it, um, logically, and it's not just fruit and uh, chocolate, it could be clothing as well. If you think about it, um, you probably know, you've probably been told this by your business teachers, um, big businesses like Nike and Adidas and other businesses, they have uh, factories in what they deem or what they call less developed economies. Okay, So some countries like, um, some countries in Africa and Asia particularly, um, countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, there's factories in there. They 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 call them sweatshops, where a lot of people are in there making um, Nike tracksuits and Nike hoodies and um, Adidas trainers and things like that. Um, and they're pay they're being paid uh, uh, maybe less than a, a dollar a day or less than a pound a day. Um, but but they're pay they're being paid um, this amount to work in these factories and these factories working conditions some of them aren't the best okay they're over cramped um the staff probably don't get toilet breaks the staff are overworked they're, they're working um too many hours without any breaks um and sometimes there's underage people working there as well so you have the kids working there um, and it'll be packed and um i think it was roughly 10 years ago and um, a factory in bangladesh actually burnt down and a lot of the people didn't make it out alive because um, because of health and safety um, laws were are quite um, well not really good or not really strong there. So a lot of people couldn't make it out of the fire exits. Uh, places weren't really labelled, and they couldn't really see or identify where the fire exits were. And um, there were too many people in these factories as well um, to escape. Can you imagine hundreds of people running to a, um, one exit whilst the whole building is, is on fire? Um, it's not really um, going to work out. But it, that was a very sad story of a factory burning down. So um, fair trade just ensures that the working conditions of the people are good. In case that, that they are getting lunch breaks, and toilet breaks, that they aren't being overworked, that they're not working um, over the legal amount of hours that they are um, supposed to work. Um, fair trade ensures that workers are being paid a fair and decent amount. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, so so that's what fair trade means basically. So that's why generally fair trade items are, are they cost a bit more than items without the fair trade sticker on it. And people usually buy fair trade products because they feel like they're uh, paying towards the person who's going abroad. Okay, they feel like you know they're, they're paying towards good cause. And the last ethical factor there um, is animal testing. Okay, so businesses need to ensure that. You know, well, they don't need to ensure, but it will be good or great for businesses if they avoid animal testing. So a lot of products, like your shampoos that you use or your makeup that you use, a lot of these products are um, tested on animals first. Okay, and the reason they're tested on animals is to see if they um, if they get an allergic reaction. And if they get an allergic reaction, um, then this item um, probably won't make it to the processing or won't make it to the manufacturing part. They won't manufacture this item or product. On a mass scale and it won't reach um supermarket lines and the shelves okay so that's why we have animal testing in place all right to, to test out whether um, animals get a severe reaction and if they do then this product is just you know stopped the production of it is stopped okay um however a lot of people are uh, protest against animal testing there's environmentally friendly products and they believe that Businesses should just use these. A great example is Lush. If you've ever heard of Lush or seen Lush in, you know, on the high street or in a, your local Westfield shopping centre, um, Lush is a uh, is a um, it's a business that offers like things like bath bombs um, and other household essentials. And they actually don't test out their products on animals. Okay, they don't do no animal testing, um, and that's one of their USPs. And that's why a lot of people buy into them and invest into them as a business. OK, so these are uh, your environmental and ethical factors, which you need to be sure to discuss, OK, in your unit your marketing exam. Now, last slide, um, the PESTO analysis is assessment focus four. It's part of your justification. Now, and remember, in the justification, it says to use one or more analytical tools. Now, my suggestion is to use PESTO and SWOT. In the next video I do, I'll be going over um, a SWOT analysis. Okay. Now remember to explicitly relate to the research given and your own research and ensure your pestle is applied to the business or industry provided in the case study. Demonstrate an understanding of the needs and wants of the customers in the market. Okay. So don't just write generally about pestle and bring general things into it. Make sure you're talking about um, your target audience all right? or you know, your main customers in the market for whatever the business gives you or for whatever the case study gives you in terms of the business or the industry. All right. So good luck for your unit two developing a marketing campaign exam. Um, I would kindly just ask a small favor to subscribe to my channel. Uh, follow me on Instagram and TikTok. Um, the at is Mossin underscore teacher. Um, thank you for listening and hopefully you do well and you smash your exams. Good luck.